Okay, sounds good. Um, so uh, my name is Grady Pastor. I'm a graduate research assistant um, in the Department of Aerospace Engineering at Auburn University. Um, today I'll be giving a talk on my master's thesis work, um, but more specifically today I'll be discussing the, valid the validation case um, which uses OpenVSP and Flightstream for propeller optimization. So kind of the outline of what I'll be talking about, um, the actual propeller optimization itself, um, validating Flightstream, the source for the geometry, some of the data collection, uh, which involves scanning the actual models um, and then processing that data. Then I will discuss the actual OpenVSP build for each of the models um, and then exporting the mesh. And then finally, the flight stream validation. So the propeller optimization um, is for a variable pitch propeller using a real coded genetic algorithm. The optimization scheme is built using Fortran and relies on flight stream to provide accurate performance data for each propeller. The propeller is optimized based on efficiency and a user specified thrust over four flight conditions. So the user will specify a takeoff condition, a cruise condition, 70% cruise speed, and then 110% cruise speed. These geometries are constructed using a Bernstein polynomial, which describes airflow, shape, twist, sweep, and chord lengths over the span of the propeller. Each propeller depends upon 67 parameters predicted by the GA to describe its geometry and adjusted pitch values for each of the four flight conditions. So we can see here the layout of how these parameters are distributed. So 24 parameters describe the airflow surface or the upper airflow surface, 24 describe the lower surface. We then have five parameters for the chord, five for the twist and five for the sweep. Then finally, there's four pitch angles at each of the flight conditions for a total of 67 parameters. Here's kind of the framework of the GA itself. Uh, so we have 128 members per generation with a total of 100 generations. Um, the four fittest members are passed on to each generation um, and they're passed to a mating pool. And this is where the next generation will be produced. Uh, this generation is produced by Laplace crossovers, single point crossovers and uniform crossovers. This new generation then undergoes a series of power mutations in order to ensure a large amount of variance in each generation. And this is just to avoid um, any local maximums that would be uh, run onto. So the optimization is actually a still, uh, still a work in progress. Um, so while the steady fixed solution um, has full boundary layer coupling modeled, the steady, steady rotary solver in flight stream does not have this feature yet. And you may have heard Vivek's talk yesterday where he went into more detail about this. Um, However, though, the steady rotary solution does have separation markers that are provided, so we're relying on them uh, for proper corrections to our propeller model. Um, so you can see below, I ran the GA for four, um, for a total of four populations uh, with 10 generations in each one, and they all sort of converge on the same kind of clunky propeller. Um, this is because a lower limit was set to the chord values to kind of avoid um, the, um, the problem of the flow separation. And so you can see here that the limit is set from for this flow separation marker is set from zero to 1.2. Um, zero indicates fully attached flow and the one indicates fully separated flow. Um, so you can see all these have most for the most part attached flow. Um, but as far as the correction goes, so I mentioned a lower limit set to the chord values. Um, this was the first adjustment we made. However, this was kind of thrown out because it was more of an artificial adjustment to the GA in a limited design space. And we also saw that the um, chord values met the lower limit within about 10 generate or 10 populations. So next we applied a correction factor to the actual thrust calculated by Flightstream. Um, so this was kind of a penalty function as more faces were, um, were seen by or more faces saw detached flow, uh, the thrust was decreased. Um, and now we are trying uh, directly including the amount of separation on the propeller into the fitness function. So um, we can output the actual number of faces that have the fully detached flow. And so if more than 20% of the faces see this fully detached flow, the propeller will be given a fitness of negative 10. And this is just to ensure that it will not be passed on to the next generation. And so this covers most of the propeller optimization, which I'll be talking about today, which is uh, my master's thesis. So now I will move on to the actual validation for flight stream. Um, so the source for these validate, validated propellers comes from the University of Illinois Propeller Database. This consists of three volumes that have propeller performance for nearly 140 propellers in low speed wind tunnel tests. The data consists of a large variety of propellers from different manufacturers, and the propellers are relatively small and used mainly on small UAVs and model aircraft. And the performance data provides thrust and power coefficients for all propellers at given advance ratios. For this particular validation case, these advance ratios range from about 0.1 to 0.9, and the RPM values range from about 3,000 to 6,000. 
Um, so the geometry data necessary to model a propeller inside the database is only provided for some of them, and even then it lacks information. Um, so here are actually the five propellers chosen for this validation. They were obtained from volume one and consist of five different master air screw propellers. So we have an electric 11 by seven, an electric nine by six, Simtar 11 by seven, Simtar nine by five, and a GF 10 by eight. And so all these propellers are shown to the right of their names and they should be scaled with respect to each other. So here's the data for the geometry that was provided by the UIUC database. Um, you can see we are given radial values and then the corresponding chord and beta values in a table. And this was very easy to enter into OpenVSP um, because we could just go into the blade tab, select a radial value, and then type in the according uh, chord and beta uh, value. So notice though there is no air pool data given. Um, so we had to work around this uh, by actually scanning the propellers. So um, Airfoil data was gathered using a 3D scanner. Uh, we scanned the upper and lower surface of the propeller and then put the two together to provide the necessary information to reconstruct the airfoil in OpenVSP. Um, so here you can see in the top image, this is actually one of the propellers that we scanned. Um, notice it's covered in this white film, and this is actually a raw image from the scanner. Um, we actually had to cover it in this kind of it was a painty, uh, like a pasty kind of paint. Um, so that the scanner could actually pick up the propeller. Um, the scanner had a very difficult time picking up the original, it was, the propeller was black, so the scanner couldn't get any real light to reflect off of it. So when we painted it white, we we're actually get a, able to get a much clearer image of the propeller. And so here's the actual point cloud from that raw scan. Um, and the, this, is, uh, this point cloud has been added to. So if you can look in the top image, you can see the trailing edge is sort of blended together with the surface behind it. Um, and so when I was trimming these, originally I ran into an issue of trying to figure out where the trailing edge ended and the background started. So I had to add more points um, in MeshLab. And from there, I was able to easily define where uh, to sort of stop trimming the propeller. So yeah, all these propellers were trimmed and cleaned up using MeshLab. And then, um, so actually here is the scanner we used. It's called the GoScan 20. It has an accuracy of 0.1 millimeters, uh, volumetric accuracy of 0.3 millimeters per meter, and a scanning area of 380 by 380 millimeters with a depth field of 250 millimeters. So the scanner is shown on the left and an image of the actual scans are shown on the right. So this is our setup. You can see these sort of clunky looking um, triangles shown uh, where the center of them has three textured dots and the outsides of the points have these three colored dots. So the scanner needs at least three points of contact or to know where at least three points are at a given time in order to pick up new information. So we placed these blocks all around it for the scanner to keep track of them while it obtained information about the propeller. Um, and so you can see the propeller here is shown uh, with that same sort of white uh, paint drawn on it. So after we scan these propellers and clean them up using the mesh lab, the point clouds were loaded into MATLAB and then oriented upon the appropriate axis. We just used PLY files for all these point clouds. Um, the data for airflow sections were then, uh, for the propeller were then extracted and further altered to enter into OpenVSP. So all we did here, uh, we have the top scan of the propeller in the upper image and the bottom scan of the propeller in the lower image. And so we just took cross sections uh, at various sections to get these top curves and bottom curves. OpenVSP has the ability to use these airfoil files, these are just .af files, uh, to model cross sections of propellers where the leading edge is 0, 0 and the trailing edge is 1, 0. Um, so airfoil sections after they were gathered, gathered from MATLAB were rotated and translated such that the leading edge was located at 0, 0 and the trailing edge was at some point on the x-axis. These were then normalized by the chord length. So here, just a sanity check, we graphed one of the uh, airfoil sections we gathered. So the top curve is shown with the blue dots and the bottom curve is shown with the orange dots. And then on the right, you can see an example airflow file. I will go into the format of this uh, later on in my presentation. So a fuselage geometry, uh, to start at least, the fuselage geometry was inserted and used to construct the actual hub of the propeller. So the length of the hub was set. Uh, this measurement was taken by a caliper. We didn't need to scan for this. It also gave us a good reference to make sure the scan geometry came out correctly. Um, so then a total of four cross sections were used. Uh, the middle two cross sections were circles and the first and last cross sections were points. So here in the design tab of our hub, we can see uh, the length was set to 1.28 centimeters. And then in the cross section tab, we can see that the second cross section uh, is a circle in type and the diameter is 2.46 centimeters. So then we began with the propeller geometry. So we added the propeller uh, by default in OpenVSP and then uh, three blades are added to a propeller when it is first introduced. 
So for all of our cases, the number of blades was set to two. Um, and then we move on to the actual cross-sectional data. So a total of 65 cross-sections were produced in the cordwise direction and 45 cross-sections were produced in the spanwise direction. Generally for lifting surfaces in flight stream, you need enough cross-sections in the cordwise direction to kind of capture the uh, curvature and necessary and then the necessary amount of spanwise cross-sections to create a rectangle with the spanwise length of a cross-section equal to roughly three times the chord length of a cross-section. So you can see this uh, attempt at this down here at the bottom where we have our chord, uh, chord-wise cross-sections are one-third the uh, span-wise. So, and then in the actual gen tab, we can see where we set the numw and numu to 45 and 65. So then we move on to the design tab. This is where the diameter, the number of blades, and the beta angle at 0.75 times the radius were set to the desired values. Um, so all these models were built in centimeters. So this is 25.65 centimeters in diameter with the number of blades set to two and the uh, beta angle at 75% of the radius was set to 16.69. Now we can move on to the actual blade tab for our geometry. Uh, the cord and twist were set using the geometry data provided by the UIUC database. This was very easy to implement. We would just go to the blade tab, we would come to the uh, curve section and select cord or twist, and then we would insert values to split upon and then inter insert the actual data that was provided by the database. Um, so points for, were inserted at every uh, 0.05 uh, times the radius value. Next, we move on to the actual scan where we implemented that into VSP. So airflow cross sections that were obtained with the scanner were implemented by using an AF file. This reads the X and Y coordinates of the airfoil. So the lines uh, for the specified file are shown here. So you can see the file on the right and then the actual uh, what each line does on the left. So the first line is our file type. It's just an airfoil file. Then the name, which is going to appear in OpenVSP when you load it in. So I chose to name this one 0.7439 times the radius, just so I knew where uh, where to load it in and which um, cross section went with which point. Then you can specify whether the an airflow is symmetric or not. In our case, we put a zero because it is not symmetric. And then we'll specify the number of upper and lower points, and then the, we'll input the actual upper and lower points. So how we would do this is we come to our choose tab, we would select AF file. Then we would click on read file and then we would select the actual file which we want to implement at that cross section. Four airflow sections were implemented for each of the propellers. These were taken at roughly 20%, 40%, 75%, and 100% the radius for each propeller. Due to unreliable sections in the scans, uh, these values actually were adjusted. So I believe this is for the GF uh, 10 by 8 propeller. We actually had to use 18% and 74% instead of the 20 and 75% like we wanted. Um, and this didn't have too much effect on the results. Um, we just had to move them because either that section, it was very rough data or I trimmed too much or um, there was not enough points to actually get a clean propeller. And so these sections, sections were just chosen because they exhibited the most change in the actual airflow shape along the span of the propeller. Over here, we see the actual final geometry for our, um, this is the GF 10 by 8 propeller. So on the far left, we can see the wireframe being shown where the propeller is given in blue and the hub is given in red. And then if we move to the right, we can see the shaded image. And then this is just rotated to show you the 3D view of the propeller. So once the propeller model has been completed in the analysis tab, we can select the uh, ComGeom tool. And here the model is just converted to a solid meshed body. Um, the half mesh can be obtained. Uh, and this just cuts the body down a plane of symmetry. Um, and this is very useful for uh, the steady solutions of flight stream. However, for unsafe solutions, the entire mesh will need to be imported. So we ended up just doing the entire model. And as you can see, there aren't a, you know, a ton of mesh faces to begin with. Uh, for each model, is probably somewhere around 4,000 to 6,000 mesh, face, mesh faces, which is a very fast solution for flight stream. So we left the entire geometry as is. But once you hit execute, you should get a geometry that looks something like this, um, or sorry, go from something like this to look something like this, where it's just one body. Once the comp geom tool was executed, the file tab was then selected to export the model. So all models were exported as stereolith files or STL files. In the STL options, the tag multi-solid file was selected, and the STL file was then saved and imported in Flightstream. Flightstream is the tool used for this, a mid-fidelity tool with very short computational times because it's a surface vorticity solver. Uh, solutions are provided on the order of minutes and in sometimes seconds. Uh, generally for the steady solver, we can see our solutions in about seconds. And for the unsteady solver, it's usually somewhere on the order of minutes. So Flightstream uses surface vorticity sheets and vorticity-based loads for the propeller analysis. 
And the solver can operate in steady and unsteady cases, as I mentioned before, and it can also operate with compressible or incompressible flows. So for all of these propellers, we used compressible flows to model them. The unsteady solver can also provide solutions for edgewise flight, as well as flight conditions where advance ratios are extremely low, such as hover. So here are two images from our steady rotary solver. We have the vorticity shown on the left, which ranges from negative 0.6 to positive 3. And we have the separation marker being shown on uh, from 0 to 1. So again, 0 shows where the flow is completely attached, and uh, 1 indicates a completely separated flow. Next, we can see our coefficient of pressure uh, with respect to the reference velocity we have inserted. And this ranges from negative 1.5 to positive 1.2. And our velocity magnitude is shown on the right, ranging from 0 to 50 meters per second. Next, the unsteady solver is shown. Um, so uh, you can see on the far left, this is after one time iteration of 0 0.0001 seconds. And then as we progress to the right, we can see the, action, the model uh, work towards the number of iterations we gave it and we almost get a full rotation by the end. Here are the actual solutions um, from FlightStream for each of the propellers. So on the y-axis, we have thrust coefficient, and on the x-axis, we have advance ratio, and on the far right of the screen, we'll actually have our propeller, uh, which we are modeling. So in this case, uh, we have the UIUC wind tunnel data, which is provided in blue triangles. We have the FlightStream data, which is provided in these orange circles, and that's for the steady data. And then FlightStream unsteady data is provided in the green squares. So the unsteady data and the steady data were both plotted here just to make sure that the solutions would match up. Um, and you can see that they're very near each other and actually match up almost exactly. And then both of them run right through kind of the, um, the um, scatter of the UIUC wind tunnel data. Next, we have the electric 11 by 7 propeller. And again, we can see the flight stream did a very good job at predicting these values. Um, there is a, so these values are actually for the steady rotary solver and the rest of the values shown will be for the steady rotary solver. Um, but you can see that flight stream did a great job of predicting uh, you know, the expected values from the wind tunnel data. Um, there's a slight over prediction as we get to these lower advance ratios, but that's expected for the um, unsteady solver. As I mentioned before, it doesn't account for um, flow separation on the back of the propeller. Again, electric 9 by 6 propeller, we see a little bit more of an over prediction at these lower advance ratios, um, and that can be attributed to this for the same reason. Uh, however, you can see the uh, results start to match up as you get to about 0.4 to 0.5. Um, they start, the results start to line up with exactly what was expected of them. Um, the same can be said for the Scimitar 9x5 with a little bit more of an over prediction until we get to about 0.5 in our advance ratio. Um, this is likely due to uncertainty in the scan, um, but overall the trend was captured pretty well uh, for this propeller by Flightstream. Lastly, we have our Scimitar 11x7 propeller. Um, again, a large propeller, and this lined up with almost exactly what was expected from the wind tunnel data. Um, you can see the uh, flight stream solution for the study runs right through kind of the uh, spread of the wind tunnel data provided by uh, the University of Illinois. So there are two main sources for these discrepancies between flight stream results and the wind tunnel data. Uh, the first is the geometry data produced by the scanner for smaller propellers. So like I said before, that scanner needs at least three points or to know exactly where three points are before it can pick up many more points. And with the thin leading and trailing edges of the propeller, as we moved around um, with our scans, the scanner seemed to not really know where the leading edge seemed to start and stop. And the same goes for the trailing edge. So there is probably some unreliability in the airflow that was gathered for them. Um, the second comes from the significant scatter in the wind tunnel data. Um, so as you saw on the previous slides, that scatter uh, was a pretty wide range. Um, and actually, so, you know, we don't know exactly where it's going wrong with that. Um, and then currently under investigation, as I mentioned before, is how much flow separation affects the lower advance ratio of thrust calculations. And that's something we're still working on with my master's thesis. With that, I'll take any questions. Thanks, Brady. And, uh... You know, good work building up the models in VSP and uh, demonstrating how you can run out to flight stream. Um, I don't see anybody popping in uh, questions here in the live chat on YouTube. And, we'll, give them, uh, we'll give them just a second. Yeah, uh, yeah, it takes a minute for that to catch up. You're right. Grady, I don't know if, you're, uh, if you've seen this, but I wrote a project earlier this year. I wrote a MATLAB program to... 
um, automatically parse all of the data in the UIUC database uh, easily into memory. Um, and so you might check that out. It's one of the things I'm sure you found about the UIUC data is it, it's somewhat inconsistent in terms of what information is available for what props and how it's formatted. So, um, and so if you want to do a comparison with a large number of props, obviously it's not going to make geometry data appear out of thin air or airfoil data appear that's not there. But um, for example, you might consider looking at uh, if you wanted to, you know, try and attempt of building these with less information, you uh, you might look at that MATLAB script that I put up on the file exchange and and might play with that. Okay, yeah, that sounds great. We've had a uh, a question in the live chat pop up on um, on the timeline for the optimization process completion. Uh, you said you were still working on it. Do you have a ballpark of when the optimization is expected to be complete? Um, so I actually just hit run this morning on the newest update we made to it. Um, and so these run times take uh, somewhere around a little little over a day. Um, so hopefully by then I'll be able to judge kind of better, but I'd say hopefully uh, by the mid-November. So do you guys have a, a hypothesis as to, you know, what you expect to be better than say a traditional Atkins lead tech type, Liebeck type uh, propeller optimization? Um, or, you know, what kind of an answer you expect to get different from, from uh, a blade element derived propeller design? Right, so hopefully we're getting trying to get the 3D geometry, which involves the actual airfoil shapes. We have, you know, the optimizers that do just the, I guess, the thin blade. Um, and this just, I guess, uses the 3D. And there's more uh, inputs you can involve in this optimizer um, that I didn't actually mention here. Um, but right now we're just getting extremely thin propellers, or at least the cord is extremely thin because of the viscous coupling effects. Um, so we're just trying to work around that right now. Okay. You know, we've got a couple more questions uh, popping up in the feed, and um, it, it's kind of nice we have a couple of minutes to actually get to a few of these. We've, we've kind of been running up to the wire this week uh, on some of them, but um, one uh, is asking if the uh, optimized propeller can be set up for a particular uh, flight regime, such as cruise. So uh, it seemed like you had four different flight regimes where it was trying to find the best of uh, all of those scenarios. Does it do a uh, like a cruise optimized uh, setup where you can more heavily weight the optimal solution towards one flight regime or another yes yeah, so it's you enter uh so i guess four thrusts four altitudes and then um uh, four speeds and then you enter uh the weights given to efficiency and the weights given to thrust so right now i have it on a one to ten kind of scale so i'm giving the cruise efficiency a 10 uh, the takeoff efficiency somewhere around like a five and then I'm making the thrusts uh, somewhere on A because I want those to be matched pretty much exactly to what you input. So yes, there's a weight. It's a weighted. The fitness function for each one of these is a weighted average. Awesome. Um, thanks. Um, so we've got a question about the availability of the, your thesis when you're finished, and I I presume Auburn University will make it available online as a PDF once you're done. Uh, but then also a question about. Um, that the surface mesh on these appears to be finer than other things they've they're experienced with with flight stream. Is this required, or do you think you could use a reduced tessellation? You could definitely use a reduced tessellation. We were trying, um, or at least me, I originally thought that something was wrong with the tessellation when importing these. That's why we're getting like an over prediction of them. So for that particular model, I just increased it to kind of a ridiculous amount. Um, it's a little high, yes. Uh, for these models, these giant propellers, it's much lower actually. Um, from optimi optimization just to get faster run times. Okay. And, um, you know, from from my experience working with X57, I, I kind of feel your pain on the laser scans because we have had a, uh, a similar uh, series of challenges, both with the high lift propeller blades and uh, the cruise propeller blades um, because uh, laser scans that are that accurate have a tendency to have a lot of noise and trying to go through and find the mean path between all those points is no small challenge. And even writing that out to an airfoil file uh, can be difficult. 
the nice thing uh, I think about you know OpenVSP in particular is if you have that information and you can assemble it into a single uh, say STL or tri mesh you can bring that stuff in and um, here in just a little bit actually it's kind of a nice segue we'll talk about slicing these uh, watertight meshes for cross-section identification so that being said um, you'd be able to go in and if you understand what the family of airfoils happens to be for a certain propeller you can use fit model and tweak the values and have it um, matched to very high accuracy uh, without having to go through something like a call fan shape transformation or um, or what have you to try and fix it so um, depending on how noisy that data is um, you might be able to get around some of those issues as well okay Yeah, there's a lot of interesting challenges there that um, <laughs> I, I think I, I love this kind of project for, for a master's student. And um, one of the fun things about this kind of project is a lot of the challenges end up being not where you expected them to be. Right. So. Well, thank you very much. That was a really interesting presentation. Yes, thank you.